Welcome to Defenders of Wildlife Lunch and Learn webinar series. This is an educational series offered by the Southeast Field Team to bring our members and supporters a little bit closer to the work that we're doing, uh, have you meet some members of our team and learn how you can get involved with our programs. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite programs that we have here in the region, it's something that we've been working on for over 40 years and it is the protection and recovery of the Florida panther with an emphasis on helping people to accept and coexist with the panther and share the landscape. My name is Tracy Davids and I am the Southeast Program Coordinator based in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, I help to lead outreach efforts for the region and I will be the webinar host today, guiding us through the presentation launching some trivia questions to have a little fun with, introducing you to members of our team um, and doing a little Defenders 101. So I'm going to launch the PowerPoint presentation. So I wanted to start with a little bit of a Defenders 101 um, because I think it's worth repeating what our mission is and giving you a, a sense of what we do overall as an organization. Um, Defenders of Wildlife is a 75 year old nonprofit organization that is dedicated to the protection of all native animals and plants in their natural communities. We have a very simple and straightforward approach to that mission. We work on the ground, in the courts and on Capitol Hill to protect and recover imperiled species across the continent. Um, we have six field offices as part of our field conservation program. That's the work we do on the ground. And those six field offices are in Alaska, California, the Pacific Northwest, Rockies and Plains, the Southwest, and here in the Southeast. And there's an excellent reason that we work here in the Southeast. And that's because we have mega biodiversity and we also have a growing human population and very few protected areas. Those are the areas you see on this map in green. Um, and so all of that contributes to many threats to the biological diversity in our region. Um, and within this region, because there's so much to do, we have some focal landscapes that help us to prioritize our work. Uh, the first is the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Uh, which is home to a huge amount of freshwater fish and amphibians. Then we have the uh, Carolina coasts that is home to the endangered red wolf. Um, and then in Florida, we have the uh, Florida Panhandle, the greater Everglades and the Gulf Coast. And um, in Florida, we work to conserve and recover wide ranging species, um, such as Florida panthers, manatees, sea turtles, as well as habitat specific gopher tortoises. Uh, we also work to secure a statewide habitat network that protects interconnected lands and waters. And we champion practical approaches to ensure that people can coexist with wildlife. So from the beautiful ancient Southern Appalachian mountains to the longleaf pine savannas of the coastal plain to the river of grass we call the Everglades and the windswept dunes of the coast, this is the region that we protect. And we have an amazing team of people here in the Southeast working to protect the, these lands and all of its inhabitants. So joining me today from that team, we have two members who work on our Panther program. And the first is Elizabeth Fleming. Elizabeth, Hello. You wave. Um, Elizabeth is our senior, senior Florida representative based in St. Petersburg, Florida, who has led our Panther program for over 15 years. Among other things, Elizabeth is responsible for promoting and expanding the field conservation program in Florida and works to protect and restore Florida's imperiled wildlife, conserve core and connected habitat for wide ranging species and incorporate wildlife conservation into transportation and land use planning. And then today we also have Jane Johnston who is one of our Panther coexistence coordinators 
who we contracted with this past fall to help expand our Panther coexistence program. Uh, before Defenders, she worked in classrooms and on trails with fourth and fifth graders, providing Panther education. Then as the first Panther outreach specialist for Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Additionally, she also contracts with uh, FWC Bear Management Program. And in her free time, she teaches and educates students through Pro Project Wild, Project Wet, and Project Learning Tree. And so to kick off our, the meat of our presentation, I am going to launch a trivia question um, to have a little fun with here. So our first question is, and all of these are anonymous, so you can answer with confidence. It's not like playing trivia on the airplane where we know what seat you're in. Um, so uh, please participate. Um, so our first question is, how many Black Panthers are known to exist in Florida? Answers are zero, six, 15, or 25, and I'll give you 15 seconds to make an answer. Right. It looks like the polling results are in, and most people answered correctly. The answer is zero. There are zero Black Panthers in Florida. And to tell us why that's the correct answer, along with lots of other fascinating information about Panthers, is Jane. Jane, why don't Great. I take it away? Thanks, Tracy, for that introduction. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Florida Panther biology. And uh, so we're gonna kick that off with Sorry. our, hey, that music's cool. It goes, go. it goes yeah. Uh, we're gonna kick that off uh, with, we're gonna call this cat our poster kitty today. This is FP224. Uh, FP stands for Florida Panther. And all Panthers are given a, a name and a number or initials and a number from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So she's Florida Panther 224. You'll notice she is wearing a tracking collar that is pink and green. And that's gonna come back a little bit later in this presentation. So uh, 224, we refer to her as a Florida Panther. Her scientific name is Puma Concolor Corii. Uh, all Puma Concolores are around the United States, North Central South America, uh, but our Florida Panther has a subspecies named uh, for the scientists who looked at specimens that were in universities and museums around the country and saw that the Puma Concolor that lived here in the Southeast looked a little bit different, had some different measurements. And so it got his name as a subspecies. So that's Puma Concolor Coria. So her ancestral range. So where were, could Florida panthers be found? Well, eight southeastern United States. So now they can only be found in 5% of their original range. Uh, you can see that their original range went as far west as Louisiana and Arkansas and to the northern parts, a little bit in Tennessee and the Carolinas, but now mostly found in South Florida. Uh, take a look at the red there in the bottom. That is uh, below the yellow line is where the breeding population is. That's where the females are. Above the yellow line, that's where male panthers are starting to disperse in other parts of the state, looking for females, not finding them, but they are finding food and habitat. So what's, what is her size? What are the size of her relatives? So on average, adults are gonna be 60 to 160 pounds. Males are gonna average about 130. Females will average about 80 pounds and they may be lighter or heavier based on whether they're pregnant or have given birth and are taking care of kittens. The length of their body from the nose to where the tail meets the body is about four and a half feet. Uh, the tail is almost as long as their body, gonna be about two or three feet long and they're two, two feet high at the shoulder. 
So what is her color? So this is goes back to the trivia question, these next couple of slides. So Puma Kunkalor, no matter where they are found, all of them are tan. Uh, they can be a reddish tan or golden tan. In South America, you might find them in really light tan colors, but they're always going to be tan. They do have a little bit of black on the back of the ears, on the tip of the tail, and their face. And then kittens are spotted with blue eyes. So they have large, bold black spots when they're kittens to help them blend in with their palmetto dens of dead vegetation and dirt. They are often mistaken, bobcats are often mistaken for panthers. Um, they do look a little bit similar. There is a significant size difference, although they don't hang out together, so you can't tell that. But you could take a look at a bobcat. They do have a black back of the ear with a white patch. They have numerous small spots all over their body that they keep for their lifetime. Kittens will lose their spots when they start to become about six months to a year old. Uh, and then what you can't see in the photo is the tail. Bobcats have about a six inch tail compared to the panthers two to three foot long tail. There are a lot of mistaken identities. So uh, the myth of the Florida black panther still exists. Um, and there's uh, some confusion about that. Of course, panthers hunt at dusk and dawn, which is the worst time of day for human eyesight. And they're usually gonna be in, in some kind of tree cover. So they tend to look very dark, but they're gonna still be tan. They do have, of course, some other cat relatives that are black, jaguars and leopards who were spotted as well as bobcats can be found in a black phase. We also in Florida, we have black coyotes and a lot of house cats get misreported as panthers as well. Uh, but keep in mind, nowhere the puma cunclor is found are any of them black. They've even looked at their genetics and they don't have the genes to produce melanism or black fur. So what is her role in the ecosystem? You know, why is it important that we keep panthers around? Uh, because they are the apex predator. So they are eating uh, animals beneath them in the food web. Nothing is eating them. Their primary diet consists of deer and they help manage the deer population so that overforaging or overeating of grasses uh, and landscaping doesn't happen. And they're also managing for disease. Deer do contract some diseases that can be easily uh, transmitted. So they're very contagious. Uh, now, does the panther know that the deer is ill? No, but the ill ones are easier to catch. So that's how they're able to manage the population. And that benefits the health of the entire ecosystem where they live. And this is a composite of the animals, just a few of them that live in panther habitat. So what is her diet? I mentioned it a little bit there a minute ago. Uh, they do love white-tailed deer. That is their primary diet. And that's what they were eating for the most part until the Spanish introduced hogs to Florida uh, about 500 years ago. So deer and hogs are multi-day meals. They're fairly large animals. The panther eats the nutrient-rich organs of these animals, and it will take them a few days to do that. And so once they've hunted it and they've started eating some of those organs, they are going to cache it or store it by putting it under some bushes and then covering it with some leaves and some dirt. Now, they also eat smaller animals in their habitat, like armadillos and raccoons and opossums. Um, and we're also finding as panthers recover and human population grows and the interest in hobby livestock farming grows that they are eating livestock. They are eating things that belong to people and we call that a depredation. So on the bottom right is a list of all the animals confirmed to have been eaten by Florida panthers. So the started out with the picture of FP224 with her pink and green collar. Well, this is her again with a yellow collar. So why is she our poster kitty? Well, it's because she represents the, all of the challenges that Panthers have for living in this South Florida area, a growing population, vehicular strikes, uh, space, food, depredations. I mean, if she's encountered all of the challenges that Panthers have, and let's take a Let's take a look at a map of where does she live. So on this map, these uh, blue pins are her points from the collar. So you can see she has this wide area. It's going to be about 80 square miles. Um, males need about 200 square miles of space, so they need a lot of space. Uh, within her 80 square miles, she's been hit by a car not once, but twice. So the first time she was about eight or nine months old and they gave her a pink and green collar. And then in 2018, she was hit by a car again and they changed her collar. So 
She's been hit by a car in this area. She's been relocated far away from traffic. She goes right back to Golden Gate Estates, which is a suburb of Naples. And there's about 24,000 residents and 12,000 homes here. Most residences are about two to five acres. One acre of that is cleared. And then there's a lot of land that she's able to utilize. So she's, she's been confirmed on a depredation. She's had two kitten dens right next to a golf course. Uh, so she really is the poster kitty of uh, Florida Panther Recovery. Thank you, Jane. Uh, fascinating information. Really appreciate that background on the Florida Panther. Um, we're going to transition to our next topic with Elizabeth Fleming. And to do so, I'm going to launch another polling question uh, to kick off this section. So the question is, in 1982, who was responsible for selecting the Florida panther as the state animal? Your choices are Defenders of Wildlife, Governor Bob Graham, school children, or Florida man. You've got 15 seconds, and I'll uh, spare you the music. <laughs> Glad to see some votes coming in for Florida man. All right. <clears throat> so let me share the results and show you that most folks on the call chose the correct choice, which is school children. School children were responsible for um, naming the Florida Panther as the state animal in 1982. And uh, to share more information about the Florida Panthers conservation history is Elizabeth Fleming. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Here we go. Without the music, please. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be a Zoom webinar without a few techno snappers. Of course. So the endangered uh, Florida Panther is the last representative of the Phoenix surviving in the eastern United States and depending on where they are found. You've all heard this. Pumas are called uh, cougars, mountain lions, panthers, catamount, painters, all sorts of different names. But they're all really the same animal. Um, so for the next slide, the Florida panther occurs as Jane showed you. Um, only down in this dark purple part of this map in, in the southern half of Florida is where the where the panther occurs now. But originally the range really did go throughout the entire southeast. And it is less than 5% of where it originally occurred. The population is estimated at 120 to 230 adults and subadults. And even though that is extremely small and very endangered, panthers are a great deal better off than when they were uh, listed uh, on the Endangered Species Act in 1973, when there were estimated to be 12 to 20 individuals that were inbred. They were all related and they had terrible problems. So they're trying to expand northward and that's why we're here. So, and, and, and show where they came from. I mean, originally, we don't really know how many panthers there were that were from the, the southeastern United States. There's one estimate that's um, 1,360 animals in Florida alone. And once, you know, settlers got here, just as has happened with wolves and bears and, and all other predators across the United States, persecution, hunting, land clearing, and other activities undertaken by the settlers caused panther numbers to plummet. And there were misconceptions in here and it led to widespread hunting and persecution. And Florida had a, a bounty on panther scalps. Um, started in the late 1800s, but it was not even uh, eliminated until 1950. So people were rewarded for killing a panther and bringing in the scalp. So that went on till 1950. We nearly wiped them out, but panthers were good at hiding out in some remote areas. So we fortunately still have had them. So when the Endangered Species Act came in, in 1973, the panther was estimated at, as I said, only 12 to 20 individuals. 
and there were so few of them and they they really only had you know few others to mate with they had cardiac defect reproductive problems the kittens weren't surviving so the es the endangered species act really ushered in efforts to halt the panthers downward spiral toward extinction this animal was on its way to extinction and so the major threats are still here. We have habitat destruction and fragmentation and vehicle collisions. I think we, we all hear about quite a bit and we lose dozens every year. Um, last year, 19 by cars and trucks, one by a train. Um, and we've had several killed so far this year. It's, it's a threat, but it's also a limiting factor in habitat Panthers expand northward, which is what they need to do. They need to reclaim that former area where they used to occur. And then, of course, lack of human acceptance for sharing the landscape. People are afraid. People don't like uh, a predator eating pets or livestock. You know, there's all, all various um, reasons why people have issues with, with predators. So we, that's going to be the focus of the rest of our presentation. So. Of course, the, you know, in Florida, we have a tremendous uh, pressure for development. People are moving here, even with, with COVID, they say, has put um, greater emphasis on people moving to Florida to get away from other states where there have been greater lockdowns and um, the money goes further in this state. So people are moving to Florida. So. Once the land clearing and the fragmentation happens and roads and all of that, and then it, it just happens. So the greatest threat is for panthers and, and many, many other species is, of course, uh, loss of habitat. And then the road problems and makes it hard for them to expand northward. So that's all going in here. So, and, and we passed uh, New York a couple of years ago. We are the third most populous in, in the country. I don't think many people realize that. More than 21 million residents. So what do we do here at Defenders and with our, our colleagues? We've been working for decades to conserve and restore a state wildlife habitat network that connects public and private lands, which will enable panthers to expand their range back, in, back into where they used to occur. And we've been very successful. Florida, for all of its craziness, we have conserved over 10 million acres of land. More than, you know, about a third of the whole land mass of Florida is in some form of conservation status. And we can't rest on our laurels because, as I mentioned, the development pressure is so great. But we've done a good job in the past, and we need to keep that up. And so, Panthers are wide ranging. They, um, as Jane mentioned, for males, a panther needs about 200 square miles and, and females have a, a smaller range, but 70 square miles. So they, they need to cross roads and their reality is there are a lot of roads in Florida and they need to cross them when they're looking for territory and mates and food. And, we lose many on the roads each year, too many, as I had said, you know, 20 killed last year. That's too many. Um, it makes it harder for them to expand, and it, it's just a constant um, a source of, of loss of this population. At the same time, Florida has been a leader um, in in finding solutions. And we have more than 70 wildlife crossings that have been constructed in the state, specifically for panthers in the southern part of the state. Um, there are even many more wildlife crossings elsewhere in the state constructed for bears and other species that panthers can lose if they get there. Um, and, and Defenders has really, really put a big effort on working on solutions for transportation. I mean, I never imagined I would be working with engineers at Florida Department of Transportation to figure out solutions for, for wildlife, but that's what this work necessitates. And, and they step up and they're expensive, but we've got, we've got a lot of good headway and we have plans across the state to build many more wildlife crossings so that this will help Panthers go north. And for the next slide, I, 
want to just point out, this is a, a panther family in this wildlife crossing. The mother is over closer to the wall and it looks like another younger one is behind her and there's a, you can see a, a smaller one, an adolescent with some spots in the center of the photo. But once a mother learns where these crossings are, she teaches her kids and then they just learn. It's part of their landscape, part of their worldview and they need them. So they are very effective. And many other species, as you see, here's a bear going through there and we've documented um, Deer and bobcats and raccoon, herons, alligators, all sorts of different wildlife benefit from these crossings once they're constructed. Many, many animals, it keeps them off the road, it protects them and it protects the, the drivers who are now avoiding the collisions with these animals. As I said, there's been all this work over many decades and we hit a milestone a few years ago. In 2016, for the first time in more than 40 years, we documented a female panther north of Lusahatchee River, north of Okeechobee. Uh -huh. I hear the people mute there. Yeah, if you, uh, <clears throat> if you are unmuted, please mute your audio as um, we can hear your conversations. And I think it's interfering with hearing Elizabeth. Oh. As I was saying, um, recently we hit a milestone in panther recovery. This gave us all a lot of hope. A female got across that river. Now several females have gone across that river, the Caloosahatchee River. If you remember earlier in the, in the program, Jane showed that slide where she said the breeding was south of there. But now we've started to have breeding just north of there, a few. Um, it's a small but super important uh, milestone to getting panthers north of where they have been for all these decades. And they've started to breed because there are males up there. And believe you me, when a female gets there, those males will find her. And so then we've seen some kittens up there. So that is tremendously excellent <laughs> news for all of us who work on this. So... But at the same time, as I said, we have all this pressure and, and um, you know, roads and development and people and conflicts and all that stuff. So it's just, it's a constant, constant um, uh, challenge. But these animals are resilient and they are doing what they need to do. If we can preserve enough habitat, they will do the rest. That's all, that's all we need to do. <laughs> so anyway, um, as people and panthers come into contact within the same space, then, then, then we have some conflicts. And that's another issue to deal with, as, which we're glad panthers are more numerous, but now, now people get a little freaked out when they look in their backyard and see one, such as this. Can you imagine looking out your window and seeing that in the backyard? I would be thrilled, but not everybody is. And, um, so this is what we, we spend a lot of our focus on, partnerships, education, outreach, advocacy, all of that. We work very hard to increase understanding of Florida panthers and to help people share the landscape with these very, very endangered animals. And we launched our what we call our Panther Coexistence Program in 2004 to respond to an increase of panther depredation on livestock and pets as as the panther population began to increase and people, people's population increased in those same areas, largely that Jane showed that map in Golden Gate Estates. That's where many of our conflicts occur. So that's a lot where we work. We selected the Florida panther. It's our official state animal. We're doing this presentation right now because this coming Saturday is Save the Florida Panther Day. Um, our state legislature uh, designated that. It's in statute. And so this is a big deal. The Florida panther is our state animal. So we work really hard to keep it on the path to recovery. Um, how do we do this? We're normally super, super busy right now with um, outreach and going to festivals and 
educational events and all of that kind of thing and helping homeowners. Um, but COVID has all these restrictions. So this particular festival where these pictures were taken, it's called the Swamp Cabbage Festival in Henry County. 45,000 to 65,000 people come through there on any given weekend. And obviously we're not doing that kind of thing right now, but that's how we get the word out about um, living uh, with panthers. So um, we, we have workshops and demonstration projects and we distribute materials in rural residential areas. And since 2007, we've, um, we've helped people build and fund predator resistant enclosures so that they can put their small livestock and um, pets in an enclosure to protect against panthers and many other predators. And um, they work very well if you put the animals inside of them. <laughs> so sometimes people forget to do that and so on and so forth, but they work very well. And then neighbors tell neighbors and they, the word gets out that way. Even though this year has been very different, um, there's another slide, Tracy. Even though this year has been very different, we've gotten the word out and we've helped to build a couple of these enclosures in some residential areas in Southwest Florida um, to protect, as I said, like goats and sheep and chickens. And um, it's, it just, it's, it's a win-win. The residents then feel safe. It, we call it protecting people, pets, livestock, and panthers. It really, it helps on every level. And so um, that's what we're up to. And we're, as I mentioned, the challenges are, are tremendous, but the opportunities and solutions are out there and, and we're just very, very busy. And so we thank you for listening today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to Jane in just a moment. We have our final trivia question to uh, kick off for her presentation. Um, and the final question is, uh, defenders predator resistant enclosures are strong enough to withstand a black bear, a Florida black bear. True, false, or we'll see. Give you a few seconds to fill that out. And share the results and um, the answer is actually, we'll see. Uh, we're in the process of um, figuring that, that out now. And I think Jane is gonna tell us a little bit about that um, in addition to um, more information about our Panther Enclosure Program. Um, yeah, so we're currently testing the enclosure to see if it can withstand bears. Usually what you recommend, because uh, panthers and black bears live in the same area, they're living in Golden Gate Estates among all those people. Um, and so electric fence is usually recommended, but sometimes people, especially with their pets and children, are a little bit concerned about using electric fence. So if our enclosure can withstand bears, that's just one more bonus uh, added to that. So talk a little bit about depredations. So a reminder that that is when when a panther eats something that belongs to a person. Now there is a hierarchy of risk associated with what type of encounter people have with panthers. Depredation is considered an encounter because the panther indirectly has encountered uh, your pet, you by your by uh, your pets essentially. It's considered low risk because those depredations are happening at night uh, when you are in bed and asleep. But the risk involved is when I was talking about multi-day meals, they are caching or storing those goats or those sheep or alpacas in people's backyards. And they're not gonna move away from the area uh, very far. And they're gonna come back every two or three days and eat on that carcass until they're done. And so the potential of a negative encounter with a person is there. It's not always a panther. There's a lot of other things that live out in Florida's wildlife. You know, we have an abundant biodiversity here. So there are feral dog packs and coyotes and bobcats and raccoons and uh, wildlife likes to eat the same things we do. And they like to eat our pets, unfortunately, but that looks like the food source they'd find in the wild. So the enclosure is good to protect against panthers. We picked the apex predator. So it will protect against all the other predators as well. 
So how can defenders and you protect FP224 and all her relatives living in the estates? She's not alone out there. The predator resistant closure program that we have, uh, we offer two pen sizes, depending on how many animals you're keeping. There is a 10 foot by 10 foot or a 10 foot by 20 foot, which the 10 by 20 is pictured here with that lovely family. And you can see they've got a variety of wildlife in there. Um, and they're now secured and protected because the same fears that have existed about panthers still exist. Fear of being harmed by panthers, fear of economic impact by panthers. So the enclosure helps to alleviate both of those. Um, and if you partner with defenders on one of these enclosures, then we also assist with ongoing repairs. Florida gets something called hurricanes, and sometimes those enclosures do get damaged. We will come out and help repair it or replace it. Uh, we'll also transfer it if you leave the area or no longer keep livestock. We can transfer it to another uh, livestock owner, and we'll also relocate it for you if you uh, change areas within the Southwest Florida location uh, if you move from one house to another. So uh, we help with the assembly of it. We do ask that you participate in that as well. Uh, we do ask for folks to pay for it if they can. Uh, sturdy enough enclosure to prevent panthers is gonna be about $1,500. Uh, but in some cases, people need some financial assistance and we're willing to chip in there, uh, as well as our partner, the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. So if you need financial assistance, we don't want that to be a limiting factor for you protecting your pets. Um, so let's talk more about other. Hey, this is a picture of our most recent installation. Just less than two weeks ago, we've been working with this uh, livestock owner for a couple months on arranging a time when we could come out there and install the enclosure for her. So she has a number of animals that she keeps. Um, unfortunately, she had a num number of animals that were depredated. We don't know if it was for sure panthers, but we wanted to make sure we protect her animals. And so she's got a couple goats here. She also has some dogs and some chickens. And so now she has an enclosure to protect those animals. Uh, she was one of those cases that needed some financial assistance. So we were able to uh, use uh, funding and our partnerships in order to help reduce the cost for her. We do want the livestock owners to have some financial investment in it so that they'll be more likely to use it uh, once it's installed. So who did the installation? Uh, I can't forget to mention Wesley O'Connor, who is not on the call today. Um, he is what we consider our boots on the ground. So I do the outreach and the education and Wes is my partner um, in the enclosure program uh, process. He's the one that actually organizes the ordering, uh, the collection storage of the enclosures, and he'll, uh, he'll organize the assembly of the enclosures once we get requests for them by application. So his boots are on the ground in a different area today. He's currently assisting with managing a fire in Big Cypress National Preserve. So what can you do? You know, we have a lot of people that are with us today and we're gonna have more viewers later on. So we, what we're asking folks to do is spread the word. You know, talk to your friends and your neighbors, your colleagues, you know, whoever you come in contact with, talk to them about what Defenders does, the steps that they can take in panther conservation. You can stay informed about what we're doing if you join our national and Florida Facebook groups uh, and you can engage actions that protect panthers and all the other imperiled species we work on. You can volunteer with us. You know, we haven't been able to get out into the public near as much as we normally would. Uh, we do presentations, we attend events. We always need help. That uh, Swamp Cabbage Festival is huge and I can't do it by myself. So uh, hopefully you'll volunteer with me once we're able to go back to some event attendance. And we also canvas neighborhoods. Uh, we go door to door, leaving information about our program for residents in the Golden Gate Estates area. You can also advocate for increased funding for the endangered species programs. Um, we have action alerts available for you to send. Uh, you, we recommend we have some tips for you to meet and contact your elected officials so they can support uh, the endangered species programs. You can write op-eds, you can write blogs, you know, anything that gets the word out. There's a number of ways to do that. Uh, ask for more funding uh, for federal and state land acquisition and management programs. You know, one of the bigger challenges, especially in Florida, where so many people want to live and the inflation of property uh, costs is getting the government to chip in enough money to purchase those lands. Uh, make sure that there's funding available to do that. And you can join in the efforts to safeguard the Endangered Species Act, 
and the other bedrock legislation like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So uh, if you follow the news during the last administration, you know, there were a lot of, uh, there were cutbacks to those uh, legislative uh, acts that are decades and decades old. Um, some of those will be restored with the new administration, but we have to advocate on it no matter which administration is in office. So help us do that. Thank you so much, Jane and Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to anybody uh, who has questions for any members of our panel. Um, and also we will uh, pull some questions from the chat box. Um, maybe we'll do that to help kick us off. But if anybody has a question and you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it, um, please feel free to do so. Can, can panthers jump fences? They sure can. Yeah. Really? Okay. How high can they I jump? can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the you know, one of the important factors about our enclosure program is most people don't understand the capability of a panther. They can jump 15 feet high from a sitting wow. position. Uh, they can climb, dig, wow. uh, and so they are very capable of getting into anything that's not properly secured. And I'm going to share with wow. you my panther skull. Anywhere this head fits, its body fits. So it also has to be small enough to not let panthers in. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just a fence doesn't do the trick. We, our enclosure has a sturdy roof on it and that's key to it. Yeah. Great. There's a question in the chat. Um, will they eat pythons? <laughs> sure, that's <Which>? totally possible. <laughs> um, it's not been documented, but there's, there's likely a relationship between the two where one eats the other. We just, it's not documented. Um, you know, the places where pythons have been are big expanses of public land, and now they're moving northward into more private land. And so that's going to be harder to document, but I imagine at some point we'll find out. And, and panthers are opportunistic. You know, they're going to they're gonna eat whatever they encounter when they're hungry. So if one comes across it, I mean, pythons are big. They're kind of a, a difficult animal to deal with, but there are instances that have been documented of panthers eating alligators, which doesn't seem like a particularly easy thing to tackle, but they've eaten alligators. We've also learned that pythons have eaten full grown deer, which is the panther's food. So if it can take a deer, we're a little worried that it could take a panther. Pythons have eaten bobcats. How could a snake uh, sneak up on a cat, you know, and, and certainly I'm sure that they, I mean, panther kittens are, are so vulnerable. So it's more likely that a python is gonna eat a panther or a kitten or something the panther needs to eat. Um, we had a question. Um, is it true that many people are moving into Florida like me from Connecticut? And many of us are advocates for wildlife. Do you have any programs or actions to take advantage of recent new citizens of Florida who would be strong proponents of more resources for wildlife, including panthers. This is a challenge because people moving to Florida is one of the greatest reasons that our land is getting developed and then more roads are being built and all of that stuff. And um, often people move here and then they complain about congestion and they put pressure on politicians to build more roads. but. Everyone who lives here, we, as I said, we have had a very strong land acquisition program. Our state legislature is meeting right now. They meet every year for two months and people need to get involved in local politics and state politics. That's, that's actually where the action happens on the ground. Um, so voice support for land conservation for protection of, an, of species. We're having a big problem right now with manatees and water quality. And so we need strong regulations to prevent degradation of our natural resources. And our politicians tend to weaken those and streamline those to allow and facilitate more rapid development. So it's kind of a vicious 
cycle that everyone who cares about the environment should speak up to the politicians because they need to hear it. We are at time, but we are delighted to stay on for a few more minutes to answer questions that folks have. Um, there was one in the chat about panther population numbers and trends. And I would imagine that that would be current population numbers. What is the question? What are the trends or population? Yeah, yeah, panther population numbers and trends. Um, at one point, we thought there were as few as 12 panthers in Florida. Um, so that was horrendously low. They were on their way to extinction. With all these concerted conservation efforts over 40 years, we now estimate the population, and it's a range. We don't know. You can't pop, you know, they're not that easy to go out and find, but we believe there are 120 to 230 adult and subadult panthers in South Florida. That's not north of the river. So that's a tiny number for any kind of a, a species, that's a small number. It is way better than 12 to 20 animals, but that's the best estimate we have now. Jane, when was that done? That was 20... The genetic restoration? No, the, the, the estimate was changed about five years ago, I think. Yeah, right? in 2017. 2017, so mm -hmm. I don't know what the plans are to update that. The the techniques are constantly changing. We used to have a guy in Florida who thought he knew where every single panther was, Roy McBride. He he's a tracker and he would count based on the sign that he would find in the wild. And they fly. They used to collar many, many more panthers than they do, the biologists for radio tracking, and they would fly over and, and monitor them. And we're getting away from that in wildlife um, conservation now, and it's dangerous. I mean, people have crashed in those planes. Um, with cameras out in the field and with other techniques, um, that, you know, we there are panthers where we never knew they were panthers because people have cameras all over the place, mm -hmm. trail cameras. Um, so the answer is we think it's somewhere between 120 and 230 adults and subadults, but you know, and they and they they have different techniques based on um, monitoring. I hate to say it, but roadkill, and you know, every time they find a panther and they keep track, and they, there's a lot of genetic analysis going on. But I think that our wildlife agency is in the process of trying to figure out how to update that estimate. I think we have time for uh, one one other question. Um, someone was asking, what's happening with the major wetlands that are being threatened with development? They're being threatened with development. <laughs> um, I don't, what's happening with them there, there's tremendous development pressure. We had a governor a couple of years ago who took most of our environmental laws and shredded them. And we're trying to build it back up now. Um, Florida is a very peculiar state. It's It's got beautiful weather. So lots of people wanna come here. People visit here on vacation, they have spring break and they retire here. But often new people to Florida, you know, their children live elsewhere, they're their loyalty is elsewhere and people come here and that's what we're just dealing with. New people who don't understand that this is one of the most biologically diverse places in the entire country. And then they want, you know, new roads and new houses. And so it's, it's just a constant struggle. So anyone who lives here, please, please, please advocate for protection of natural resources and, and better laws that are enforced. Um, there's one other question. I think it's, it's an important one, so I'm gonna ask it. Um, are panthers being actively bred or reintroduced in any areas? Wanna answer that one, Elizabeth? <laughs> I, can, I can talk about it too. We can both contribute, but um, the Florida panther that we have today 
was saved from certain extinction by a genetic restoration effort that was undertaken in 1995. Um, eight female puma related subspecies from Texas. And if you remember that original range map, the panther used to range right up to Texas. So it would breed with those other animals naturally, but it, after it was hunted to near oblivion, it, they were separated for about a hundred years. So they had eight females were introduced into the big cypress area. They mated with the struggling Florida panthers and it really helped invigorate the gene pool. They were much, much healthier. Their kittens were surviving. The cardiac problems uh, became much less over time. They took those eight animals out of the population after a couple of years. They didn't stay here, but they saved the Florida panther. But it was very controversial as any type of program like that undertaken by the federal government, then it becomes the federal government's animals or, you know, if, if any of those panthers got into trouble or, or killed somebody's dog or something, it becomes a big issue. So ultimately the goal we hope is to have the animals reestablish themselves on their own but it has always been part of the recovery plan, envisioning that about every 10 years, there should be more animals brought in to keep this gene pool healthy. They've not done that. And quite frankly, the agencies are timid. They don't want the backlash from people. And it's usually a vocal minority of people who, who oppose um, reintroduction. But this goes on all over the country with grizzly bears, with wolves, with any kind of predator. And, Jane, what would you like to add? Oh yeah, I was gonna say, you know, there was a captive breeding program piloted previous to the introduction of the Texas Cougars uh, that also, they wasn't, it wasn't popular, but the other is how do you manage breeding, uh, captive breeding and success to adulthood for an animal that needs 80 or 200 square miles, depending on its gender. That's just, it's a logistical challenge that can't be done. So the genetic restoration was the better option. Great. Well, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we have one more little bit of business before we sign off. And that is to announce the winner of our drawing. And that is uh, Carol Borden. So uh, Carol, you are the winner. We will send you out a Defenders prize pack. Um, this webinar has been recorded and within a couple of days, we will send everybody who registered a link to the uh, webinar along with links to other resources. Um, and I posted our general email address in the chat function. So if you want to email our presenters directly, uh, contact us there and I'll put you in touch. Um, and we are going to save the chat. So there are a lot of unanswered questions. We'll do our best um, to um, answer them for you. Um, I believe we can just send you an email and let you know. So thank you so much for attending. Uh, when you get the link to the webinar, please feel free to share it with family and friends. Um, and thank you so much for being a defender. <laughs>